Hi, welcome to our final video for Casting Stones. This is video nine titled Jesus in Everything. This is going to wrap up our study of the third chapter of Ecclesiastes. And we did through these videos, especially get into a little bit more of the entire book of Ecclesiastes, which has been really fun for me. Um, and I pray that you've enjoyed it, that you've had good discussions. Um, and if you're finishing up your last week of homework, you know, I just encourage you to finish well um, and just write some notes, write some thoughts. And um, I would love to hear them. You know, you can send them to me at ilovemyshepherd.com at gmail.com um, or contact me through the about page of ilovemyshepherd.com. So Jesus is in everything. This is actually one of our core values at I Love My Shepherd, which is really important to me. These four core values we have are the things that really help guide everything we do there, um, everything we offer you. Uh, and I think having that, knowing that, understanding the awareness of that, I'm I think that your family and your own life has your own core values, whether they're spoken or unspoken, but kind of hashing those out is really useful. So it's exciting when this idea popped up in Ecclesiastes, the fact that you know there's a lot of things in life that are really meaningless and Solomon says that, the author of Ecclesiastes says that over and over again, meaningless, meaningless. Um, but with God, there's meaning. And that's really an ongoing theme in Casting Stones. Meaningless, meaningless, right? It can feel really mundane in daily life. It can feel frustrating and, and like a struggle and a wrestling. But with God, no matter what it is, good, bad, and ugly, it has meaning. And so today, though, we're going to take that down to like minuscule form and find Jesus in everything. We've already talked about how Jesus creates everything. We've talked about how Jesus is over everything. But let's end with Jesus in everything. And when I say everything, I mean everything. We created a podcast series, my husband and I, um, on the I Love My Shepherd podcast. You can check it out on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, um, or on the I Love My Shepherd uh, media tab under podcast. And we take the craziest thing and we talk about the connection of it to spirituality. And I think when Jesus met with Nicodemus, uh, and you can look that story up on your own if you're interested, but when he meets with him, he they ask questions and everything. Um, Nicodemus asks questions about being born again, and he doesn't understand, and he's wrestling. Um, and that story really shows me how God likes to just be in our discussions, in our lives, to spiritually connect himself to our words like in our experiences in life like birth you know there's no mistake that we are reborn in baptism but that whole idea of birth is its own idea and god connects himself to that um, for us to understand what he's doing and i think the same thing can be true of so many things and obviously it's not as meaningful as like baptism or the lord's supper or uh, the word of god in community but at the same time you know i do think we can in some silly ways uh, bring god into our everyday life so that spiritual spirituality isn't just for you know the worship service or isn't just for when we gather in bible study but it's for all the time and um jesus encourages nicodemus to think eternally to think eternally and that's what i think he encourages of us too and thinking eternally means connecting him to all things um so in the podcast series we talk about things like doors or we talk about um, the one coming up in the coming year is toothpaste. Uh, and I, it'll be surprising how we connect Jesus to toothpaste, right? But also uh, we've done red solo cups. There's all kinds of things um, or phrases we use like happy holidays. So just check it out and you'll get the idea. Um, our junior high students in confirmation a couple weeks ago actually challenged us to connect Jesus to video games, which I think is really funny. So you can watch for that coming this spring. Watch for that coming this spring. Uh, what obscure item, idea, or concept can you connect to Jesus? You know, just think of anything. We used to play this game in college where we um, 
would sit around and this is how we entertained ourselves um someone would think of something like snow and we'd think of the ways we could connect god to it it sounds so silly but imagine doing that around the table with your family uh or over coffee with a friend just for fun i think silliness is important uh that was one thing that maybe solomon was missing in his struggle early on in the book of ecclesiastes is the ability to like not look at things in such a heavy way all the time how toiling life is and everything but to add a little silliness to it goes a long way scientifically speaking for our mental health for our relationships um but then also i i think that god appreciates our silliness that's actually what um the red solo cups episode of jesus and everything is about the fact that um god appreciates watching us gather he does enjoy a party you know we have the wedding feast at cana we have all he created like the wedding feast of the lamb for eternity uh when jesus comes back for us so he's he knows that all of the spectrum of experiences in life are really important um, and he is in all of them. So anything you can think of today, what obscure item, idea, or concept can you connect Jesus to? Can you connect God to? Um, talk about that in your groups maybe a little bit. It's kind of a fun question to ponder. Or someone shout out something and everyone, you know, think of a way to connect it. And, you know, this isn't theology gone bad. We're, we can't stretch it too far. But just... Uh, having the conversations helps us to see Jesus really is connected to our whole lives. Life is better with him in it. Um, and we, we don't have to stretch or overreach to connect Bible verses. Um, like, uh, you know, when we misuse a verse and we like over apply it to a situation, we don't have to do that because instead we know that God is actually connected in every way to everything. Um, and he can be found in it. Uh, I think the best way to see Jesus in everything is for us today in a concrete way is maybe through the I am statements in scripture. We really investigated these in one of our I Love My Shepherd plus Grafted Heart Advent series called Above All Names. And we went through all the different I Ams for the entire season of Advent that was last year. And it's still up on the blog if you want to investigate that. And I'll put a link in the show notes. But I think the I Ams show us how much God values our understanding him through very everyday things. Um, and these things, you know, when God speaks... He speaks truth. And so my connecting Jesus to everything is a little, uh, a lot sometimes imperfect, whereas he always connects it in truth. And it, it may very well be very literal, um, but there's always like that story concept of it too, so that we can, a parable, if you wish, in the I am for us to understand him better. So the I am's are things God says about himself, Jesus and even God in the Old Testament, um, the God of Revelation, all use metaphors and stories to help us understand concepts. Um, you know, I think we hear um, verses like, you know, when salt loses its saltiness, and that's one way in the New Testament that God helps us to remember uh, that we are to be light, that we are um, put here for a purpose, and we um, are to be a little bit different. You know, we're supposed to add spice to this world of the Jesus variety, if you will. Um, so let's look at three I am. So we're going to go through three and there's a bunch. And like I said, you can look at all of them. Well, not all of them, but many of them. There's a lot and you can probably Google and find more, but uh, you can find a large list and a scripture reading plan with them also um, at the above all names section um, on ilovemyshepherd.com. Again, I'll put a link up, but first I am the rock. The rock Um this is such a foundational, like very literally foundational truth that Jesus is the rock that we stand on. Um, he's the rock that the church is built on. He is the rock, the foundation stone of our lives. And that's really cool. I want to share with you a scripture reference today from 1 Corinthians that helps us see how the rock is also kind of an everyday idea, an everyday object, if you will, that we don't want to miss. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4. 
For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, this is Paul talking, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. So this is actually from an Old Testament story in Exodus 17, and you can read that in your groups in Exodus 17, 1 through 7. I'll put that reference in the show notes so you can find it. But I would challenge you to look up both passages, this 1 Corinthians passage and the Exodus 17 passage, and compare and contrast. What do you read about? What's the story of actual life going on, even though it's you know very supernatural, that God would choose to bring water from a rock. That's like crazy talk, right? But at the same time, you know, God used these very everyday objects to help us understand him. So what is one way that God is our rock in our life? And how does spiritual drink come out of that? How does like that quenching come out of the fact that God is our rock? You know, what is our need is a question to focus on. And I'll have these questions listed for you in the show notes. How does God fill that need for us? Why does he choose to use these everyday objects? And some of like that question may not have an answer, but it's so great to contemplate it. You know, it's so great to consider the mind of God and know we don't have it, you know, put ourselves in our own place. What is, um, very every day about the need for a drink, the need for water. What else, you know, for the other needs that the Israelites had and that the Corinthians have and that we have something to look at when we think of the rock and we think of water, these everyday things. Jesus is in them. How do we disconnect our daily needs, that daily need for drink, the daily need um, for, you know, being the people of God together, I guess. Community too is one thing I see in there. Um, To be gathered uh, with uh, this cloud and with the sea and all the things God does in that story. Look for those. How do we disconnect our daily lives to those kind of big things that we want from God, that God is doing for us? I think it's an important note in this uh, idea of God is the rock that he doesn't change. Whether we're full of praise in our life in a moment or full of grouching, he is solid and faithful and he always gives freely of himself through the sacrifice of Jesus, through his word. We are very thirsty, um, very, very thirsty. And it seems counterintuitive to go to a rock to have that need filled. But I think it's cool that God connects those things um, to bring us his love, his compassion, and his grace. So some questions to consider about the rock. The next one, the second, I am. I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. And we often, I think this is the most common I am statement. I feel like I hear very often. Um, And for that one, we're going to look at John 8, verses 7 through 12. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So this is a story, a very tender story, about a woman caught in the very act of adultery. So that means it's like the most vulnerable position vulnerable position someone can be in, I think. Um, And so whatever our vulnerabilities are, um, God does reveal them. He sees them. He knows. And whatever the world would judge us for, I guess, that's one way we can understand our vulnerabilities. So what are the things the world judges us for? If you all can answer that question for me. Um, 
you know, just brainstorm some ideas because there's a lot of judgment out there. And this is one of our primary stories that is both really important and also often misquoted or chunks are taken out of for understanding who God is. God values this woman in her vulnerability. Um, he does call her to accountability. You know, he says, sin no more, because he knows what that's doing to her life and disconnecting her from him. Um, people need light. And sometimes we think that light is only truth. And sometimes we think that light is only love. Like we take this woman's story, for instance, and we're like, well, she was she was an adulterer, you know, and and we point out the sin, we point out the things we shouldn't do, and that Jesus says that, or we only point out the love, you know, I don't condemn you, it's all fine, it's all good, you are, you know, forgiven, but both those things come together in this story and show light. So we need both truth and love for light. I think it's really practical to understand that whatever vulnerability we have Jesus is the light that lights the hope in that so maybe your vulnerability is like your marriage like you're struggling in your marriage Jesus is the light he's in that marriage he's doing his thing in all the parts of it that feel the most unright I like to make up words that feel the most disconnected from him. Those are the places where he is very much a part of and desperate to show you what he's doing there. And I think that that is true of all kinds of places. Parenting has a lot of judgment. Um, our internal self and our past issues, maybe our childhoods, maybe our own like teenage years, um, things we've been through, divorce, um, or words we've said that are hurtful, just all kinds of things, whatever your vulnerability is. And this is, I mean, this is hard to look at, but once we look at it, we that's like what confession does too. When we let, let it have light and have words for what we have struggled with, what we're currently struggling with, um, where we feel unsafe maybe, um, then we can see God's light in it. He's going to flood that, um, and we do not walk in darkness, it tells us. And it has less power over our lives. Instead, Jesus is the power in our life. This woman needed light in her life. Jesus offers her care, safety, forgiveness, wisdom, which is very Ecclesiastes, right, and truth. Um, the people around her also needed the light of the truth. We all need it. Um, if they needed to hear you know, the truth of Jesus. They needed the light of Jesus. They also needed the forgiveness of Jesus instead of just setting their stone down, but to learn from him and to grow from them. And so when we ourselves are the people dispensing judgment, there is also light and forgiveness in God's word. And it's a good place to go from, to find him, to see him. Um, even even though he's right inside of us, the word really helps us to see that clearly. Otherwise, we can easily miss us miss it in our like little uh, minds in our little lives. You know, I always forget the connection of light of the world to this story. I always expect it to be somewhere else. Like, um, you know, you expect it with. Uh, the ascension on the hill and Jesus is like lit up and glorified and he's the light of the world. That would make sense. No, instead, Jesus says he's the light of the world in this pretty obscure story um, in John. And he says it again and again, so that's really helpful too. But I think it's cool that light is connected to his words of care and concern here. Where around you do people need light? You know, where do people need a voice to speak for them, to share God's word with them, both directly and, you know, indirectly? Um, where do people need light in little ways, but then also in those big ways? Um, you know, this woman, this is a big moment for her. But where were the places in her life maybe before this moment where people could have infiltrated with the light and shown her light in caring ways um and sometimes that means we share the word and the gospel absolutely um very straightforwardly like quoting a bible verse and sometimes we share it in less straightforward ways 
and and de- deciding what kind of light people need from Jesus at a certain time, you know, what they're ready for and everything is important. So the last one, I am the bread of life. Uh, this is John 6, 28 through 35, the bread of life. is a very everyday. I don't think you could, my husband had a sermon about this one time. I don't think you can get more everyday than bread. And it's really cool that Jesus chooses to come into our everyday even though he could be lofty, you know, he is lofty, but he, you know, takes all that loftiness of himself and puts it into our very everyday things, our everyday moments. And that's so grace filled. John 6, 28 through 35. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? You know, where, what must we be doing to like see God in our life and to be doing God and like living with God and all those things? How can we bring meaning to the everyday is their question. That's very Ecclesiastes question, right? Jesus answered them. This is the work of God that you believe in him who had he in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do? that we may see and believe you. What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. It's almost like, give us this bread every day, right? Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. When we were in Spain last fall, it was really fun every day to see these little old women walking with carts to go to, or or bags sometimes, to go to get their bread every day, fresh bread. You know, we live in a world where things... um, fool us into thinking that they last you know we buy bread from the grocery store and are like oh i'm good for the week uh when the reality is how many times have we bought bread for the grocery store and then we're like wait i just bought this two days ago like how is it bad um even those things that last because we put all kinds of chemicals and stuff in them uh have a sell-by date they have a mold date (laughs) jesus is the only thing that lasts um and so i think it's cool to see him as both that like bread that we um, never have to replace again. We never have to go to the grocery store. We're always filled in him. But also that he wants to do that with us every day. You know, that it's a very fresh thing for us to have Jesus in our lives and to read his word every day. Jesus is just enough for what we need for this day. That's the understanding of bread that they had um, with man- that's connected to manna. That's the understanding of bread in the New Testament. In many, many cultures, like I said, in Spain, uh, they the bread is for the day. That's what they have. And, and in many cultures where poverty is a reality, um, you know, you don't have extra. This is what you have. And that's Jesus for us. He's just enough for this day. He's just what we need for this day. As the bread of life, that baby boy in a manger uh, that came to walk with us, that bread who comes down from heaven, it says, and gives life to the world. He fills us. He sustains us for that day. And he sustains us for eternity. It's really miraculous. You know, we study the word. We come for communion. We're filled with his body um, and blood and the bread and wine. He gives us all. I mean, it's just as layers upon layers of God's amazingness um, in what he gives us for the everyday. Um, And, you know, but... The message of Ecclesiastes rings so true here in all that, not just in the communion table and not just in the word and not just in going to the grocery store to buy bread for our families. Does God give meaning? Those things aren't separated. They're all brought together by his word. And, you know, with God in our lives, in our everyday and in our eternity, there's meaning in everything and how much of the world needs that you know where do you see around you a lack of meaning um 
sometimes people are searching for it and sometimes they don't even know where to start. Um, we need that meaning of who God is in our lives in absolutely everything. So my challenge question for you today is where can you find Jesus in your everyday, you know, back to the beginning, um, but, you know, maybe less in a silly way this time, but where is he? When you sit around your tables, where is he when you get up in the morning? Where is he when you hug your family? Uh, where is he when you go to the grocery store? Um, just think of one of those spaces, one of those like weird mundane things you do every day. And where is God and how is he bringing meaning to that today? This is the last one of Casting Stones. Um, there are more ilovemyshepherd.com studies on the drop-down menu at ilovemyshepherd.com under studies available. Try He Calls Me Loved next. That's the study of Isaiah, and it goes through titles that God calls us in Isaiah. Or you can use Altogether Beautiful, which is available through Concordia Publishing House. Those... Um, Altogether Beautiful has videos included just like this, only they are for purchase, but they're not crazy exorbitantly expensive. Um, and I think that I this connection that you... Let me try that again. <laughs> I'm like, my words are so lost because when I think of you all on the other side of the screen, I wish I had a better way to connect. You know, I wish I could come and sit in your living rooms um, and hear your stories and apply them and all of that. But instead, I feel like what God has given me to do is to write and to hear from you in the comments, to hear from you in notes that you send, in emails, on social media, whatever, so that I can kind of write toward that. So I really love hearing from you. I love hearing your experience with the studies, whether it's in a review or just, um, you know, uh, like a comment or a note or something. Uh, I appreciate that connection is what I'm trying to say. And um, when I hear back from you, uh, then I can see the connection and we continue on. You know, it's like a reciprocal relationship instead of Heidi just dispensing information um, or, you know, some kind of insight about God's word. And if that's all it ever is, that's all it ever is. Um, I know that God's word goes out and he does not return it void, that he does great and awesome things in your life today. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time.